Hi, this is Pod Save the UK. I'm Nish Kumar. And I'm Coco Card. And like the turd that won't flush, the government's Rwanda policy is back and stinking up Westminster. Plus, should countries that got rich off the back of slavery be forced to pay reparations? Yes, we mean you, Britain. MP Clive Lewis and journalist Laura Trevelyan will be here to tell us about the fascinating journey that they went on together after discovering a shared connection on the island of Grenada, where his ancestors were enslaved and hers were slave owners. Hi, Nish. How are you? Very good, Coco. How are you? I'm good. I feel like we haven't, you know, chatted. How, how's everything? Well, uh, uh, that sounds like you've heard something's gone terribly wrong in my personal life. <laughs> I feel like we haven't talked. Yeah. Just, no, but, is everything no, but, okay? How are you? Yeah, you, know? you look bad. <laughs> <laughs> but what's, what have you been up to? What, what's going on? Um, I, I'm struggling to make conversation with everybody this week because okay. over the weekend I did uh, the kind of bonus podcast after show discussion program for a show called The Traitors. Uh, and for people outside of the UK, The Traitors is pretty much all people in the UK are talking about. <laughs> there, there is an American version that's hosted by Alan Cumming, I think. Oh. But the UK version is massive, hosted by National Treasure called Claudia Winkleman. And I did uh, the podcast over the weekend that's also a TV show hosted by my friend Ed Gamble where we discuss the latest episode and because of that I am two episodes ahead oh wow one of our producers has already said he's not speaking to me because there's a danger of me revealing spoilers about it you know have you ever had that thing where you take out 300 pounds from the cash point and then you have to carry it to wherever you're going why are you taking out 300 pounds <laughs> sometimes I need cash <laughs> sometimes I just do all right for legal <laughs> reasons we can't go into anything further. But you know when you walk from... It's definitely not buying drugs, okay? Everyone, <laughs> yeah, everyone just leave it alone. Up. Anyway, listen, sometimes <laughs> you've got to pay a plumber. You've yeah. got to pay a tradie. And yeah. they like cash. Anyway, what I'm saying is... A tradie <laughs> or someone who trades these. <laughs> so, so when you when you get the money out of the cash point, you know, you... You, 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 feel, feel, you, feel, you feel the you, burden of... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I'm wondering, yeah. is that how you feel? You've got uh, well, the national treasure. It's obviously... Yeah, I've got... I carry secrets for a programme that everybody's obsessed with. It is very tense. It, I, I spent a lot of, like, early years of stand-up. It obviously doesn't happen so much nowadays, being paid in cash. And that... The walk home with 200 quid in your pocket, especially because at that point you're like, if I get robbed, not only have I got robbed, but I'm also not going to eat this week. <laughs> yeah. It was obviously, it was very tense. <laughs> I remember saying to one of my mates once, this is just an aside, I was like, you'll never guess what I figured out, yeah? What you do is you boil eggs and then you put them back in the box and then you always have hard boiled eggs. And I just remember that moment. What, you thought you, you, you thought you'd done a life hack? <laughs> I, yeah, and I just remember that moment of telling everyone. Coco, that's just called boiling eggs. No, but come on, doing, doing them all at once and then putting them in that there. Loads of people do that. <laughs> L loads of people do that. Well, I was really proud of myself. And just that moment where you see their face and you're like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> this is Coco Khan's new section, Life Hacks. If you're boiling one egg, why not boil three? And then you have two other boiled eggs <laughs> next time you want boiled eggs. I actually do the whole batch of six, just to let you know. But it's really important. <laughs> it's, really, it's really important that you label it hard-boiled. Because otherwise, someone else will go and think that's otherwise an egg. You're just gonna, otherwise, you're just going <laughs> to peel an egg. For more life hacks, stay tuned to Pod Save the UK. <laughs> Has so much political capital ever been spent defending a policy as weak, unworkable and, frankly, deranged as the government's plan to send would-be asylum seekers to the tiny Central African country of Rwanda? Rishi Sunak's Safety of Rwanda bill has been back in the spotlight as it reached the committee stage of its passage through the Commons. Cue the usual grandstanding by factions on the right and left of the Conservative Party pushing competing agendas and threatening Number 10 with rebellion. We're recording this on Wednesday and as things stand, the rebels have given the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, something of a bloody nose, with up to 60 of his MPs voting for amendments to the bill last night. But none of the amendments, which rebels think are needed to make it harder for the bill to be challenged in the courts, actually passed. So Sunak... He's got what he wanted, but at what cost? Two of his party's deputy chairman, Lee Anderson, Brendan Clark-Smith and a ministerial aide, Jane Stevenson, quit their roles to vote with the rebels. By the time you're listening to this, we'll know how many of them were willing to defy the party whips and vote against the bill itself. It's worth saying that siding with a rebel amendment is very different 
from voting with the opposition against your own leader because that would be torpedoing the entire flagship bill and throwing his government into free fall. But Coco, I want to take you back uh, to the start of the week and the extraordinary front page of the Conservative supporting Daily Telegraph, whose headline would have had their Tory readership absolutely choking on their Monday morning cornflakes because it read that the Tories are facing a 1997 general election style wipeout and it was based on a huge poll by YouGov which predicted a 120-seat Labour majority with 11 current Tory cabinet ministers losing their seats. And it is worth digging into where this poll has come from and what it could possibly be seen to be achieving. Politico has been reporting that it was commissioned by a group of Tory donors called the Conservative Britain Alliance, uh, who are working with the Tory peer, Lord Frost. So you can actually Google the Conservative Britain Alliance. It just finds one entry on the entire internet, which is the Telegraph article. So it does look, from the outside at least, like this organisation has been set up by Lord Frost, or at least with Lord Frost's backing, to try and fuck with Rishi Sunak, essentially. And that begs the question, why would a Conservative group be pushing data that essentially suggests that the party's heading for an electoral Armageddon? So the... The speculation is that Lord Frost and this group, Conservative Britain Alliance, they want the Conservatives to go more right wing. So they release this data that effectively says they need to go more right wing in order to avoid this extinction event. So that data is released on Monday. Monday is the start of what we were talking about earlier, all these amendments and all these conversations around the Rwanda bill. So it's not unreasonable to suggest that this was all timed, it was all planned, and effectively it was to scare people into voting for these amendments, to scare parliamentarians and even constituents to emailing their MP and saying, like, you need to make this Rwanda bill be harder and tougher. You know, I think it's important to mention that the the purpose of this bill that we're discussing this week is so that Rwanda is designated a safe country. But, you know... Home Office has granted asylum to people coming from Rwanda. So everyone that's actually working with asylum applications knows that this is completely farcical. The I, the newspaper, has been reporting that the Home Office has been granting asylum to people from Rwanda, even as the government is trying to declare it a safe country. So we've got, on the one hand, Rishi Sunak saying Rwanda is a completely safe country. And on the other hand, his own home office turning around and saying, well, obviously we'll grant asylum to people from Rwanda because it's not a safe country for them. So it's... It, the whole thing is kind of a nonsensical feedback loop of stupidity. Oh, yeah. No, it is completely nonsensical. I mean, one of the things I found, you know, really alarming about this this conversation about the poll was that it it was the front page splash on the Telegraph, right? This is the sort of stuff that consumers of media hate. The idea that press actually is no longer objective and it's just the mouthpiece of whoever it might be. That is the... That is the the heart of the problem with the British press. And it's, it makes me really sad because it's like you're not even trying anymore to hide it. Um, yeah. And I should point out as well that YouGov was unhappy with the Telegraph's interpretation yeah, of the data. Yeah, because we should say the poll wasn't sus, but it was the Telegraph's interpretation yes. of the poll. And that's what YouGov picked them up on. Yes, exactly. And there's always a concern with things like this. I mean, like, you know, my father-in-law, again, doesn't share the politics of the Telegraph, but likes the cricket coverage. So he occasionally picks up uh, a Telegraph. And, you know... This front page will be on kitchen counters. It will be in the newsstand. There will be people that will take it on face value and they will genuinely believe that there are huge swathes of the British public that want this Rwanda policy to go ahead, that want us to be more xenophobic and more Little Englandy and more kind of uh, isolated. And actually, that's not 100% true. And in a way, you, you, could, you could argue that by filtering out these stories, they're almost manufacturing this belief that this is what the majority wants. But is it actually true? Is that the case? Well, what I would say is Rishi Sunak has made the Rwanda bill the kind of central piece of flagship legislation of his government. And it has not worked in terms of improving his standing in national polls going into an election year. It hasn't worked at all. Because, I mean, I, I just can't escape this idea that when you can't afford to heat your house or feed your children, you couldn't give less of a shit about this kind of stuff. And I think that, again, it's the Conservative Party being having their agenda set by a very small group of its own voter base. And 
our conservative voters are embracing very, very dangerous rhetoric. Mm. The, the AFD is on the rise in Germany. Geert Wilders is winning elections in Holland. The Conservative Party should be taking a stand against the lapsing of centre-right politics into the grip of the hard right. But it is not because of craven, weak-minded cowards like Rishi Sunak. Exactly. And as much as we can get drawn into this kind of Westminster watching, it's important not to lose sight of the human cost of all of this politicking with the recent stormy weather abating. This weekend saw the first channel crossing uh, for nearly a month. The Home Office confirmed that 124 people crossed the channel in three boats on Saturday. For some, though, it ended in tragedy. Five people died on Sunday in French waters after boarding a boat near the resort of Wimereau. I mean, it's just horrible. And like the government will say, we need to stop the boats but they can't stop the boats. So I don't know. It's We're going to talk to Clive and Laura later and they're talking about the you know legacies of slavery and, and by extension, the legacies of colonialism. And one thing I often think about all the time was like, if you don't want people to come here, you could maybe make their homes safe places to live yeah. by not participating in wars or not participating in the exploitation of their resources or even just the climate. Like, yeah. you know, stop pumping fossil fuels and carbon into the air, burning fossil fuels, sorry, and and pumping out carbon into the air to make these places more hospitable. And actually, I think, here's a Tory slogan, hate ethnics, love cycling. <laughs> What do you think? What, you're trying to appeal to racist we can, conservative voters? We can voters. trick them. We can trick them. <laughs> by saying, well, you could stop immigrants coming by getting a uh, More green car. policies. More green policies. Uh, international aid. Peace. Keep ceasefire. Britain white by going green. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joining us now in the studio are our guests, Laura Trevelyan, former BBC journalist and the Labour MP, Clive Lewis. They co-present a fascinating podcast called Heirs of Enslavement about their shared connection to the shameful days of British slave ownership in the Caribbean. And this is, uh, I, I guess, don't call it a comeback. No. For Clive, our very first guest, <laughs> yes, actually in actually in the studio. It's nice day. to see you. Yeah, lovely to see you as well. But yeah, I've just come back from Antarctica. Uh, yeah, on a parliamentary trip there, looking at climate issues, um, geopolitical issues. So yeah, it's been all all systems go. And Laura's Amazing. joining us from New York City. Yeah, the Big would Apple. Would you like to tell the listeners what you did uh, as a British person returning? To her motherland. Wow, well, <laughs> Nish, Coco, Clive. I had to celebrate with a full English yes. this morning. Because, you know, arteries clogging up <laughs> yes. as we speak. Americans think that black pudding is the most disgusting thing on the planet. So I did. They're not completely <laughs> wrong. <laughs> They're not. They're not totally oh, wrong. blood. But when fat. you have it with the bacon and the egg, come on. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. I've never had it in my life. What? No. You've never had black no. pudding in your life? No. The, the thought of it just. It just fills me with dread. Yeah, for non-British no. listeners, <laughs> no, I'm not sure. For non-British listeners, black pudding is. I mean, it is. It's a fried blood cake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all the bits of the pig that you don't really want to eat. Listen, we absolutely love the podcast, and we're looking forward to chatting about it. But before we do that, Clive, uh, we've just been discussing the Rwanda bill, and I know that you're leaving us as soon as we finish this record to go to the Commons to vote on it. Um, how do you see that vote playing out? I think um, the government the government will get their way. I mean, we saw, we saw the rebels defeated last night. Frankly, I, I was disgusted listening to the rebels. I think millions of other people in this country are. Look, there is nothing wrong with discussing immigration policy in this country. I mean, it's all we ever seem to discuss in this country since Windrush. But there's nothing wrong with that. But I draw the line at people who want to now unpick and overturn uh, human rights legislation that was born out of the genocide of the Holocaust and, frankly, genocides that took place for centuries before that. And we look around Europe, we look at the rise of fascism, we look at what's happening in Germany, and it does feel like a slippery slope. And I feel that we have to draw a line in the sand on our international obligations to the human rights legislation, which is so important. Um, and if we don't do that, well, we can look around the world, you know, the Middle East, and see what happens when that legislation isn't there or isn't able to protect people. We need it. And this is what that's about. You know, it's connected to empire. Yeah. It's also connected mm -hmm. to here and now. And I think people should be very alert and aware of what's going on. I know it's very easy to always say, you know, oh, they sound like fascists. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we're getting to that point. Uh, maybe we've passed it. 
And I think people should be very aware of what these MPs are trying to do because it affects us all, not just asylum seekers. Um, and we should also just briefly say, as a former member of the armed forces who served in the Middle East, uh, I'm fascinated to know what you think about the current situation where the UK has joined the US in carrying out military strikes against Houthi targets in Yemen. It's complicated. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've found as a member of parliament is there's this, uh, Abraham Maslow said, if you think the only tool you have at your disposal is a hammer, then you begin to look at everything like it's a nail. And I think the the use of airstrikes, I've just, I've only been in parliament 10 years and I think there have been three, different, three, four different airstrikes that we've been part of, probably more if you include drone attacks. And it just think, you look at the way the world is at the moment and you think, I think there might be a better way of going about solving some of the world's problems. I'm not a pacifist, uh, and I understand there are some very scary and dangerous organizations and countries out there. Some of them are there because we were over there and have done things. But I think we need to think very carefully as a country, looking at the escalation that's taking place over there, whether this is the right thing to do um, in these circumstances. I have questions. We didn't even get to debate it before it happened. That's problematic. That's the situation in the US and the UK as well, because there's been a huge amount of consternation um, about Biden's decision to bomb without consulting Congress. Laura, you're obviously a journalist based in the US. <clears throat> how, how is that playing out for him at the moment? Well, it's just so complicated for him because the left of his party is already up in arms about the Americans' unequivocal support for Israel yeah. in the Gaza campaign against Hamas. And now you have what's happened with the Houthis. I mean, the administration is saying that it has a right to defend itself against attacks. But I guess the wider picture is it's just as Clive is saying, you know, it's a scary world. And the way that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has now extended into the proxies of Iran and the allies of Hamas, or now you have Hezbollah, you have the Houthis taking pot shots. It's very alarming and it feels so finely poised. I know Jake Sullivan, the president's national security advisor in Davos, is talking about a time for diplomacy, but it feels like that window, it, it's really, really running out. It also in the US as well, you've got the bizarre situation where Trump's saying, you know, I'm doing the hand. I had no wars on yeah. my watch. I had no wars. And I think Biden needs to be careful. It could be a close election race with Trump. Yeah. It looks like Trump's going to be the candidate. And if, if Biden alienates the left, progressive voters, and they simply don't turn out for him, that's problematic for all yeah. of us, frankly. Wow. So, you know, Biden's got to be careful here. He can't just assume that people, progressives, are going to, they might not, they're obviously not going to vote for Trump but they might not turn out for him yeah. and he no. needs them. Let's turn to the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Airs have been laughs> uh, Laura, I believe the story of this, this whole project started with you discovering about your own lineage. So tell us about that. And then also I'd like to understand how you two linked up. Yes. Oh my gosh. Well, I, I'll give you the, you know, the very brief, the 45 second version. But essentially, um, University College London put online uh, about 10 years ago, the database of people in Britain who claimed, if you can believe this, claimed compensation for the loss of their property when slavery was abolished, the property in their, this case being their slaves. And when that database came out, I was in the US, I didn't look at it, I read some story in the newspaper which said, oh, database crashes as everybody logs on to try yeah. and find out whether they were compensated. But some years later, a family email begins... Someone says, oh, Trevelyans. If you log into the UCL database, it says that Trevelyans were compensated because we owned enslaved Africans in all these plantations in Grenada in the Caribbean. And Laura, you're a journalist. You, you, you're supposed to be a historian. What are we going to do about this? I was like, oh, dear God, I have no idea. <laughs> so you, this was never spoken about in your family? No, no one had ever mentioned that because it's so classically British, under the rug. Once yeah. abolition happened in 1834, it was as if slavery had never happened. And the whole narrative is rewritten and, oh, Britain abolished slavery. We led the world. Aren't we fantastic? Not we were up to it in our necks. Turning a, a tragedy into a triumph, isn't it? Yeah. And George Macaulay Trevelyan, this historian, my great-grandfather, his best-selling uh, English social history. So he, in his histories, he celebrates abolition of slavery as being, a, you know, a founding principle of 19th century liberal Britain. Doesn't mention that he is descended from enslavers in the Caribbean. So Clive is of Grenadian descent and 
we figured out that Clive's dad was born close to the Beausajou sugarcane plantation. In fact, we went there together for the podcast yeah. and that was part owned by my ancestors. And so we talked to historians in Grenada who said, well, Grenada is such a small island. You know, it's just over 100,000 people that live there. Trevelyan's part owned 10 plantations. Clive's father <laughs> didn't move, you know, was still living close to a, a plantation part owned by Trevelyan's. Basically, it's not a stretch to say that Clive's ancestors could have been owned by mine. Right. Mm. And can we just briefly, before we get into the specifics of the podcast, talk about the slavery bailout and the compensation package because I do yeah. think it's one of the most extraordinary and I believe... Lesser known. Yeah, lesser known and under-discussed elements of British history. So just just, just for the listeners that don't are not aware of this, please just run them down what, what you're talking about. Yeah, well, £20 million in 1834 is paid to... 46,000 claims are made for the loss of what's termed property, that property is enslaved Africans, by all the little old ladies in Britain and the big plantation owners and anyone who's linked to slavery because when slavery is abolished they can no longer have slaves so therefore they have to be compensated and the backdrop to it is and Clive's a parliamentarian then as now in order for there to be parliamentary support <laughs> there needed to be this compensation package trailed because the West India interest as it was known meaning the planters meaning the slavers basically you know they were very they were a powerful lobby I think it's important to get a size of the scale. 20 million doesn't sound like much, but yeah. 20 That's million back, then. Hmm. back in 1834 was half half of government spending. Um, yeah. So that would be... 40%, I think. Yeah, 40%, yeah, yeah, just 40% of the GDP. Yeah. So it would, be, it would be hundreds of billions of pounds. So they had to take out money. a massive loan that was only paid off in 2015 and it was only a tweet from the Treasury yeah. which alerted <laughs> which was then Britain, deleted. Britain to this fact. <laughs> it was Someone merrily hastily tweets. deleted. Someone this might know, not be a good idea. You know, we've, we've paid off that of the, loan. Many of the victims of the Windrush scandal have been paying back uh, their own, right. have been paying off so the debt that was... British taxpayers yeah. paid off this loan that was taken out uh, to benefit those like my ancestors who had lost their property, uh, i.e. lost the right to enslave people when slavery was abolished. We've all paid for that. Right, you mentioned the uh, Treasury's tweet and it reads, here's today's surprising Friday fact. <laughs> like it's so like, <laughs> oh. oh. It's, it's like a Friday fact is something like, oh, did you know salamanders can grow back a tail? Do you know what I mean? Like that's my Friday fact, not this yeah. like uh, uh, national stain or national shame. And it just said, here's today's surprising Friday fact. Millions of you helped end the slave trade through your taxes. <laughs> and of course, a lot of people were like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> what? What? are you talking about? Yeah. For a lot of people, that was the first time they realised so, that so that had happened. So part of the part of the really interesting thing about both slavery and empire is the deliberate forgetting that's yeah. taken place. And it's a deliberate thing because the reality is if you deal with the issues of empire, you have to talk about slavery. You have to talk about why there is wealth inequality in this country, why there are people with great wealth, vast wealth, institutions, individuals, uh, and why we have the kind of almost feudal um, constitution that we have. And empire opens all of that up. So they want to put it back. They want to right. say mm. simply, oh, you're only interested in digging up the negative past. You don't want... Actually, it helps you. It actually helps you come to terms with why we are the country we are today and how we can improve ourselves, how we can take ourselves forward. Right. We're trying to look at the current day legacies of slavery, which is why we went to Grenada and to Barbados. And when you go to Grenada, so there's an epidemic of obesity and hypertension, and that is related to the poor diet that came from slavery and the amount of sugar consumption. And Grenada's national dish is called oil down and it's it's pig's feet and coconut milk and other things which are incredibly unhealthy because this Sounds was like the pudding. <laughs> <laughs> right, oh, exactly. God. Laura's like, mm. <laughs> Actually, I did really like oil down. But this was... I don't like it, so I'm being consistent. <laughs> you're, you're being I'm not consistent biased in any way. But it's the one pot dish that the enslaved made. Yeah. Mm. And so there are the health consequences today in Grenada from that. The fact that poverty and illiteracy were legacies of slavery. There are still pockets in rural Grenada where people can't read yeah. today, which is why, you know, the Caribbean has a 10-point reparations plan, which Clive and I have been talking about and trying to advocate for. And it begins with a complete apology for slavery from the former colonial powers. And then there's a call for investment in health and education. 
And then on top of that, you now have climate change, which Clive, having just been in the Antarctic, can bring us all up to date on. But if you think about it, nobody asked to be in the Caribbean. Their mm. ancestors were yeah. dragged there against their will. And now these islands are at risk from climate change with more severe storms, hurricanes. I mean, we drove down the coast road, which <laughs> is flooded every time there's even just a super it, high tide. Yeah. So there's now climate resiliency funding, which I think you can argue... The former colonial powers, you know, Britain has a, a debt to these Caribbean Well, because that's what I always thought as well, you know, because just using cotton as an example, you know, cotton, slave produced cotton helped create Manchester's Industrial Revolution. That was the beginning of the, you know, the cities of Britain becoming the yeah. big smokes, just pumping shit into you the air. You couldn't make it up, could you, that, that the carbon pumped out, that was kind of funded and powered by the slave trade, cotton, yeah. sugar... Um, is now creating, you know, hurricanes right. once every few, you know, category five hurricanes once every few years as opposed to once every half a century. Um, you couldn't make it up that the poorest, most vulnerable islands that are there because of slavery, the populations are there because of slavery, chattel slavery, are now at the forefront of um, the climate crisis. There's an idea on the podcast that, you know, climate funds are a way of getting reparations packages into these countries. In 2004, Hurricane Ivan killed 34 people in Grenada and caused $900 million worth of damage. There's also an idea that debt relief could be a way of getting reparations to these countries um, and a way of dealing with legacy for the slavery. But there are points where both of you seem unsure about that. And I think there's a really interesting thing that, Clive, you say about the significance of reparations not being essentially laundered into these countries under the guise of climate compensation and as a way of making it more politically expedient within Britain. Yeah, and I think that's it's really key that the conversation around reparatory justice is critical. And if you kind of cover that over yeah. uh, th through the conversation on climate, it begins to get muddied and covered up. And what this is about is, I think Dickon Mitchell, the Prime Minister, of Grenada, who we did interview in the podcast. Yeah. One of the things, reasons he gave for reparatory justice being so critical is that we cannot rule out that these kind of activities will happen again in the 21st century. And actually dealing with it now is about saying never again. We won't allow it to happen. And look at the world. Look at the world around us. So I think it's really important that we have the conversation about, about why reparatory justice, why it's right to support these countries, given what happened in the past and our part in that and what we've extracted from them. And unless you have that conversation, yeah. and I think the fear is you give them a hand, you give them a handout, and because of the global economic system and the way it's structured, they'll be back um, to square one after four or five hurricanes uh, and the debt and um, no continuous debt repayments. They'll be back to square one in a decade or so. And they don't want that. I mean, the example I would use is Germany and Israel. After the Second World War, Germany paid Israel billions of pounds in reparations. It was established that that's what you could and should do. And Israel invested that in energy, yeah. shipping, infrastructure. And Israel now is one of the most powerful economies in the Middle East, in part because of, those, of that reparatory justice that Germany paid to it. So there's a model already out there. And I think it's one that we should be looking at as well. But isn't the reason there's a resistance to it, and do correct me if I'm wrong, it's just because the bill would just be simply too big. Right. And for people in Britain, I mean, Clive talked about this a lot during the podcast, you know, your constituents are facing high inflation. Yeah. Uh, they don't feel rich. They don't feel that they should be giving money to the Caribbean because of something that happened hundreds of years ago. And so the, the difficulty is trying to explain how the past informs the present. And it definitely does. Yeah. It's obvious. And there are also just all of the social and psychological costs of slavery in Grenada and and the tragedy of the Windrush generation and how people were persecuted. I mean, one of the most interesting things about the podcast to me was Clive's father, Tony, because yeah. he was born in Grenada, comes to Britain at the end of the Windrush generation because there are no opportunities in Grenada, makes it here, encounters discrimination in Britain, but 
battles on through, becomes an incredibly successful trade unionist, now has retired to Grenada where he's organising the fishermen, of course, because he's <laughs> a trade <laughs> legend. He's a trade unionist. But his story and Clive's story and mine, I mean, it's the story of, of modern Britain. And for Tony, the double diasporization of him, and you said it was so interesting, you said, my dad's sounding so African now, he's back in Guave. Yeah, they do. <laughs> like he's closer to his ancestors. Yeah. Yeah. There's just something about it which is really mind-blowing and and the the fact that, you know, the West Indies were regarded as the slums of empire, that's what David yeah. Lloyd George referred yeah. to them as. And people had to come here because there was no opportunity. All of that is really underappreciated oh, yeah. in Britain and the harm and the hurt and... Uh, I, I, you know, I think, so I think, I can't speak for every, you know, descendant of, of enslavement, but um, I think the conversation, the understanding, like where the journey that Laura's been on, if... People, if more people in this country could go through that journey, I think that would do more for race relations, for issues of immigration, for our, our, our place in the world, where we are in this kind of post-imperial kind of hiatus that we exist in at the moment. I think it would help this country. And I think for a lot of black people, both in the Caribbean and here, that's worth a lot. And yeah. so it doesn't have, I mean, it could be billions and billions, but I think that understanding, that kind of coming to terms with that and that healing process is so important because it will colour relations, it will colour economic relationships, it will colour racism, the immigration debate. But if we are talking about money, Ali Gill, the, the chair of the Grenadian um, um, CARICOM reparations kind of uh, committee, he, I asked him the question, well, my constituents, you know, many of them aren't going to be able to pay their energy bills. How are they going to pay? And he said, I agree, they shouldn't be paying it per se. He said, but the people who extracted and exploited us are the people who are extracting and exploiting them now, yeah. the corporations, the banks, the wealthy, the financial institutions. And he said, it's about making sure that they pay their fair share. And he said, the people that you need to be kind of getting a better deal on when it comes to wealth distribution and the same people that we're looking for. It's mad so. when you follow that line. I mean, I only learned recently from a Burner Boy song um, that Unilever had links to slavery um, and was part of, you know, colonial projects that were in West Africa and the Caribbean. Unilever. So the companies, we would know them, their household name. Aviva. It might, David, uh, uh, the historian, David Olashoga, Olish Olish yeah. he basically in a program explains that one of the families that got received the biggest payouts, the son went on to set up an insurance company. Uh, that insurance company then merged with another insurance company, Imperial Insurance, or something like that. And the two merged together at the start of the 20th century as Norwich Union, yeah. which is my constituency. Uh, which then became Aviva. And that was in part funded, originally funded, by the compensation that the slave owners were paid. So it's it's everywhere you look at. Um, I didn't know about Unilever. Yes. I didn't know about Aviva. I'm sure there are many, <laughs> yeah, many others. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're all, and I think now Laura's aware as well that there are many now corporations, banks, Lloyds, others, who are beginning to look into this yeah. um, and beginning to kind of unpick right, their role Church in it. Church of England, Lloyds of mm. London. The Guardian newspaper has yes. been, been yeah. doing a big uh, yeah, that's right. investigation into Cotton its own capital. finance. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking uh, in last week's episode about why is that after all of the reportage around the post office scandal, it was an ITV drama that has really fast-tracked the process of accountability in that issue. How important is it that you stress the personal element of this for you too. I think you were talking about the power of storytelling on on the podcast last week with yeah. rela in relation to the post office drama. And I think that Clive and I, we're a microcosm of modern Britain. He a descendant of the enslaved in Grenada, me a descendant of those that enslaved his ancestors. And the pain of that, but also the promise in acknowledging it, it, it is about storytelling and hopefully it's something that everyone can understand. Yeah, it was interesting to see an interview with you with yourselves. I can't remember what it was, but the interviewer kept wanting to pin, did you get on? Did you argue about it? Yes. <laughs> I, know, I think that's the anxiety oh, of a lot of British people. We do have people. differences, but we've become, we're friends. Clive is much yeah. more left-wing than me. <laughs> 
I, and he doesn't I, like I learned, English I learned, breakfast. I don't like English <laughs> breakfast, but I've learned a lot from you know Laura, my my favourite centrist mum. You know, it's, uh, it's but <laughs> it's American but, soccer mum. <laughs> but we, but this is the this is the, this is the complexity of the story. You know, this doesn't have to be about finger jabbing yeah. shame. No, it, me and Laura have become friends through this, and uh, despite the despite the history of what's happened, yeah. and this isn't about finger jabbing. It's a story of a relationship, but we are the complexity of modern Britain. Uh, and we're proud of that. It's, yeah. a, it's our story, but let's have the story. We're out and proud. Yeah. <laughs> we're out and proud, but we're not. let's have that story out there. And yeah. it's not about making people feel guilty. The conversation around reparations for slavery has been growing louder. So let's hear a quick clip on that topic from the podcast. So this is Sir Hilary Beckles, who's the chair of the Caribbean community, also known as CARICOM's Reparations Commission. I have said over and over again, and many economists have said this, that Britain has had 200 years of free labor, unpaid labor, from 20 million people. 20 million people unpaid for 200 years is a phenomenal extraction of wealth. And just to put back a portion of that to facilitate Infrastructure, schools, bridges, education, health is not only legally necessary and correct, but it's also morally and ethically sound. Almost a year ago, our family went to Grenada and Sir Hilary Beckles, who you just played a clip of him in the podcast, we worked with him and he said, look, you know, you descendants of enslavers, you've been, we haven't been able to see you for dust, but come to the Caribbean, apologise, you'll set an example and see what follows from that. And he was so powerful that he convinced us. So we went to Grenada, um, donated money to educational causes there. Now we've set up a family charity. And Clive was following all this and stood up in Parliament and said very simply, if a family can apologise for slavery and pay reparations, why can't Britain's government? And for me, that was like a light bulb going off. So... And that's that was the start how, of our journey. To answer your first question, that was yeah, the start of exactly. our journey. To answer your, <laughs> half an hour later, to answer your first question. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's how we connected. And then we talked on a dodgy WhatsApp line that weekend. Mm, that's and right. then, and Clive, you know, has taught me so much about, I mean, he said the We've thing, the most it. interesting thing, and maybe this will resonate for everybody as I sit here with children of empire. He he said... Um, Shout the out is, the parents of empire. Well, yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. He said, the thing is, Laura, that, you know, you've opened up a space for me to jump in, but it's partly systemic racism that, has enabled that because you have the voice, you yeah. know. White as, privilege. Is yeah. that pri- that, that links Yeah, back like to the that. world's most ghastly phrase. But yes, if anybody has it, it's definitely me. And Clive just helped me to understand so much, really. Mm. I mean, I use the right. term white privilege. I mean, it's, that, that, that's obviously that's obviously a big kind of flashing klaxon yeah. over there. But actually, it's really interesting. There have been lots of black people talking about this for decades, yeah. and they haven't been listened to and, until Laura and her family came along. And it's kind of been given a fresh and new lease of life. And that's kind of almost inevitable when you think about how structural racism works, who's listened to, who has a hearing, who doesn't. And it was always probably going to be the fact that Laura or a family like that were going to come forward and do something like this. But I'm just, I was just, when I watched Laura and her family, John Dow, stand up and make that statement, I, I was blown away by it. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't going, yeah, damn, yeah. About, about, about time. I was just absolutely amazed that people would do this and, mm. and, and take, you know, and put themselves forward to do that it's not been easy it's not been an easy journey but that's the store power of storytelling isn't it you know 30 years at the bbc if you can't hold you can't hold other people your to destiny. account it was your if, destiny. if you can't tell the truth about yourself you can't tell the truth about other people yeah. so coming from that tradition when mm. hillary beckle said if you set an example it'll be meaningful i felt immediately that he was right and that we should do it and who the heck knew what would follow from it? Yeah. But my, you know. my my final question is: uh, When you guys go out for drinks, Laura, do you get the rounds in? <laughs> she does. <laughs> no, we get the rounds in. Yeah. Each, you know, we're, we split everything we split 50, everything. 50. <laughs> yeah. I'm a huge fan of uh, making rich white people buy me drinks, <laughs> and every time they, they they they're reluctant, I go partition. 
That was pretty bad. <laughs> that was pretty bad, guys. I think you have to set a time limit on it. <laughs> 2024 is the year that everyone pays for their own drinks. We all pay for our own drinks. Well, just, Clive, I just got a push notification about a very important vote coming up. But I think you need to go. Yeah, that's, probably, that's probably my whip calling. The phone is going, the bat phone's going next to me. Get yeah. yourself back in here. Yeah. Right? We must let Clive go to attend to the business of government. Um, but in terms of the process of storytelling, uh, I would really urge people to check out the podcast. Podcast is called Heirs of Enslavement, and I hope it's a starting point for uh, a more enlightened conversation on the subject. You. And Laura and Clive, thank you, thank so, you so much, much for joining us. Today. Thank you, thank both you, so thank much. you very much. Yeah. Great. <laughs>to name our hero and villain of the week and every so often we like to switch it up so put angry nish away and get nice cuddly nish out of his box who have you got for hero well as much as it pains me to say this as a manchester united fan um i have picked the fans of liverpool football club oh. this is a real this is a real wrench for me but it is an amazing story last week the former england manager sven goran eriksson revealed he believes he has at most a year to live after being diagnosed with terminal pancreatic cancer and in an interview with skype looking back at his life he also revealed an unfulfilled wish my father is still alive and he's still a liverpool supporter and um, I'm a Liverpool supporter as well. I always been. So I always wished to be the manager of Liverpool. And that will not happen, <laughs> for sure. But I'm still a Liverpool fan. So after revealing his love for the football club and his dream of managing them, Liverpool fans have started a campaign on social media to get the club to make him manager of the Liverpool Legends team for their charity match against the Ajax Legends at Anfield on the 23rd of March. The Liverpool Echo has already got behind the campaign and Liverpool legend Robbie Fowler has indicated that a call had already gone into the organisers about it. So it's over to you, Liverpool FC uh, watch this space. It's a genuinely nice story. M- m- much as it pains me to say this, the Liverpool fans are doing something genuinely nice. Uh, and I would say, even if it doesn't happen, which it seems absurd, it feels like that should happen. But even if it doesn't happen, it's nice that Sven, as a Liverpool fan, got to feel the love from his fellow yeah. Liverpool fans. Um, Coco, get your angry face on. Who's our villain of the week? Well, you know how I feel about the trains, Nish. Yeah. I uh, have a a, a separate well of rage about uh, the trains in this country. And so this week, I'm going to point the finger at Avanti West Coast. So it's been reported that Avanti managers joked at a company meeting, joked about receiving free money from the government and about performance-related payments being too good to be true. One slide at an internal presentation was titled, Roll Up, Roll Up, Get Your Free Money Here, and described how the Treasury Department for Transport supported the firm with tax payers' money, provided third-party suppliers and inspections, and then paid Avanti fees on top. The RMT union has called the presentation first revealed by Navara Media as a disgrace. Fair play. All this from a firm, I should point out, that has a unbelievably poor record of cancelled and late running trains. It slashed timetables in December and has seen punctuality decline and cancellations worsen in recent months. Of course, they don't care because they're going to get paid anyway. And if they do happen to meet their performance targets, well, then it's just more money for them. Avanti has confirmed the contents of the presentation and called it regrettable. Doesn't quite feel strong enough. Regrettable. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Before we go, we've just got time to fit in some correspondence from our listeners. Here's a voice note that's come in from one of our American listeners. Hi, Nish and Coco. My name is Ellie. I am calling from Oakland, California. Uh, in addition to being an avid Pod Save the UK listener, I am also an avid reality TV watcher. Um, and it's for this reason that I'm calling to ask about John Burko, um, who appeared on my screen this week in the US version of the reality show, The Traders. Um, I'm calling not only as an uninformed American wondering who this man is, uh, but also to ask if you have any thoughts about him, uh, either in general or in particular about his choice to appear on an American reality show. Uh, I love your show. Thanks so much. So here's a clip of John Burko on the show being interrogated about his breathing. There was extreme intensity in the room and I was pleased it was at an end. I've never breathed particularly well. I was asthmatic in my youth. I don't regard myself as asthmatic today. 
But when you took the mask off, you said, I have asthma. But you just said, I was asthmatic as a child. That's absolutely true. I was asthmatic Is as a child. Is that what you told her? When you told me you had asthma. Look, is asthma a lifelong condition? I don't regulate... That's not the question I'm asking you. If you ask me, do I use an inhaler? I'm am asking I you, did you say that to her? I'll be absolutely honest. Well, that'd be I good. Don't... I don't remember the exact words I used in response, but what I do recall... You're answering this just like a politician. Well, I mean, that, f forgive me, but that's just a but term But you're not answering abuse. the question. Wow. So Is we're back on the traitors. We started on the traitors and we've ended <laughs> on the traitors. <laughs> Yes, John Burkow is in the American version of the traitors, I should say for British people. He hasn't just wafted over to America and gone into the normal traitors. Okay. In, in America, the traitors is a celebrity show. In Britain, it's ordinary people, like, essentially playing a game of werewolf or mafia. Whatever, however you play that game or whatever you call it by. But yeah, so for context... John Burkow was uh, a British politician. He was also uh, not just an MP, but he, he was actually Speaker of the House of Commons from 2009 to 2019. And he, he did become something of a kind of celebrity here because of the amount of coverage of Parliament, because he was the Speaker of the House through all of the debates around Brexit, and because he had quite a distinctive way of calling the House to order, where he'd go, Odda, Odda. It, he he saw he sort of became a kind of minor celebrity. Right. In answer to your question, we think this is really weird. And <laughs> it's basically like Nancy Pelosi turning up on Celebrity Love Island. Yeah, no, that is, it is very strange. I would just say that generally what I've learned from most American films and TVs is that if they are a British person, they are the villain. That is generally... He's the traitor, is what I'm saying. I don't know. I, I have no idea. I've never seen this show, but I think he is the traitor. Uh, it does look like he was panicking under pressure. I mean, my favourite bit is when he said, um, she's like, oh, you're, you're answering like a politician. I mean, he is a politician. That's fine. Uh, it's like if someone said, OK, you're being a journalist or you're being a lawyer, yeah. you know, which has happened to me loads of times. If I'm at a dinner party and I ask too many questions, people are like, OK, all right, so you don't need to be a journalist. I don't think it's like wrong. And I just loved how he said that is you're being abusive now. This is a term of abuse. I didn't know politician was term of abuse. The only thing worse than somebody saying you're really behaving like your profession is when someone goes, sorry, you're a comedian. <laughs> Um, let's just dip into the mailbag. Look, let's not be around the bush here, Coco. Yeah. Against all reason and logic, we have had our first applications to join the Pod Shag the UK Dating Club. For anyone uh, who doesn't know what we're talking about, uh, Coco suggested uh, last week, because dating apps are so awful, we start a kind of dating app for people to meet like-minded people. How better to, to do that than to bond over their shared love of this podcast? And I, as a joke, called it Pod Shag the UK. But Very now vulgar. People have genuine, but people have genuinely submitted profiles. I mean, we, if it was real, just, just, it's not real for clarity. You know, this is definitely not a real thing. But if it was, there's no way you could call it Pod Shag the UK. How are you meant to tell your mum that? What? Where did you meet? Pod Pod Shaggy. Shaggy. Outrageous. Well, look, here's the thing. We, I am going to read, uh, read this letter out. Yes. I, I don't know how, with all the kind of data protection, we would possibly go about setting two people up. But I am going to read out the email. Uh, John has emailed and uh, uh, has said this. I humbly submit my Podshag the UK dating profile. I'm a home-owning millennial who isn't a Tory. Ooh. Which to <laughs> God's, God's interest has picked up. <laughs> Oh, I see. <laughs> Married, homeowning, millennial Coco <laughs> Khan's interest has inexplicably been peaked. I've got friends. Uh, I'm a homeowning millennial who isn't a Tory, which statistically makes me about as rare as a unicorn. <laughs> and I can send Cocker Spaniel pics on request. I don't think that's a euphemism. I think he, he actually has a dog. <laughs> what more could a woman possibly want? And then in brackets, this isn't a joke. Please set me up. Dating apps and Tory Britain have been horrendous for everyone's mental health. Looking forward to the tsunami of matches. And that's from John and his Spaniel Maya. From South Wales. So no. I guess if you live in the South Wales region, I, email in. No, no, don't email in. 
this is not an area we can go into. But John wrote quite a funny yeah, no, it dating is nice. profile. I feel so conflicted right now. Have you ever set anyone up in real life? You've no, never done of it? course I've never set anyone it's up a, in real it's life. It's a weird, as I've only done it once or twice. Yeah. And you you feel genuinely, yeah. personally That's responsible. That's exactly why I've never done it. This, is, this would be a nightmare for us to get involved Be- in people this. ask me if I have single friends I'm like no <laughs> I do <laughs> even if you do I do I've got loads so of single rude. friends so rude well I just, I just I don't want the, the strain oh, wanna, of it you want to hoard the love because I you're happy you just want to hoard the happiness I, do, I just don't want to be put under the pressure yeah. of having set two people up I genuinely don't know how South Asian aunts manage it <laughs> they're constantly trying to get people married I don't know how you can live with the stress of that. Well, they're, they're, the main thing is to tell people to lower their standards. That seems to <laughs> that's, that's the main way you do it. But I guess the thing that is that I mean, this is just a digression now. But like you know, I've got loads of mates who are lovely. Yeah. But in relationships, are different people. Yeah. So I right, couldn't right, be a hundred percent sure that who I put forward was. Anyway, whatever, I digress. Um, so I've got one too, though sadly it's not a match for John. Sorry, John. This is from Jay in Yorkshire. And the profile reads, Hopeless romantic lesbian, 24. Terrible barista. Giant fantasy novels nerd. Looking for someone to go on cafe and bookshop dates and watch niches stand-up specials with. Aww. Oh, that's genuinely nice. That's... These are funny and charming <laughs> people. How can these people not be finding love? Also, thanks for getting a plug-in for my stand-up special, Jay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Available now at nishkumar.co.uk, wherever you are in the world. Thank you, Jay. If you've got something you'd like to share with us, comments on what you've heard or a question about British politics, or maybe you'd like to make use of our pod shack the UK service. We can't have this. This is in the script. We can't have this. <laughs> you can get in touch with us by emailing psuk at reducelisting.co.uk. This is bad now. <laughs> it's always nice to hear your voices, so do send us a voice note on WhatsApp. Our number is 07514 644572. Internationally, that's plus four four seven five one four six four four five seven two. Please don't send us your dating profiles, please. Oh, but, but maybe do. <laughs> don't forget to follow Pod Save the UK on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Pod Save the UK. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube for access to full episodes and other exclusive content. And if you're as opinionated as we are, consider dropping us a review. And if you're interested in John or Jay, uh, email the email addresses. Okay, just for clarity, you individually are responsible for this. I can't believe I've said I don't like you setting people up. You individually are And now going I'm to trying it. to use my own <laughs> podcast as a matchmaking service. Legally, I am not responsible. Just I, wanted to say that out loud. I told you I'm middle-aged <laughs> and I have genetically Indian. It's just... Even though my rational brain is fighting it, my urge is to marry people off. Oh, it's going to be so good. It's going to be so good. (laughs) Uh, Pod Save the UK is a reduced listening production for Crooked Media. Thanks to senior producer Musty Aziz and digital producer Alex Bishop. Video editing was by David Kaplowitz and the music is by Vasilis Fotopoulos. Thanks to our engineer, David Dagahi. The executive producers are Anishka Sharma, Dan Jackson and Madeline Herringer with additional support from Ari Schwartz. Remember to hit subscribe for new shows on Thursdays on Amazon, Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts why are you looking at me with the look of i hope you're happy (laughs) with what you've done i'm just i'm just gonna sit back and watch this car crash (laughs) i'm gonna sit back and let you do it